Hello and welcome to Databases on AWS as part of the AWS Innovate online conference. My name is Blair Layton and I'm the Business Development Manager for Database Services in Asia Pacific. I'll be taking you through an overview of the managed database services on AWS today. I will also talk about how you can migrate your databases to AWS and from one database to another. AWS consists of our global infrastructure with 16 geographic regions across the world, all interconnected with our network backbone. Then in each region, we have our network services such as virtual private cloud and CloudFront. The three main service areas you will typically consume when building applications on AWS are our compute, storage, and database services. Today, we are going to focus on the managed database services, Amazon RDS, Amazon Elasticash, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon Redshift, and the AWS Migration Service. All these services that I just mentioned are managed database services. So why would you use a managed database service instead of running your own database on-premise or even on EC2? Well, have a think about how much time your DBAs and other IT staff spend on provisioning hardware and storage, installing, upgrading, and patching software, doing documentation, licensing, and training, backup, recovery, data load, and unload, and especially security. Then ask yourself, is that really adding value to the business? Looking at this in another way, here is what you do if you have to host your database on premises. You need to manage all aspects of your environment, from power, high voltage air conditioning, and networking, to application optimization, and everything in between. If you host your databases in EC2, then AWS can take care of the infrastructure components from the data center up to the operating system installation, but you will still have to perform the operating system patches, database installation, database packages, backups, manage high availability, scaling, and application optimization. If you choose a managed database service, such as Amazon Relational Database Service, or RDS, then the only thing you need to worry about is your application optimization with AWS, taking care of everything else. This allows you to focus on what really matters for your business. Imagine you have a competitor who is in the same market as you, with the same resources, but your competitor is managing their own environments and you are using managed services from AWS. You will be able to focus on your application and be more agile, delivering new capabilities to your customers. This will make you stand out from your competitors. Now I'm going to talk in more detail about AWS database services, starting with Amazon RDS. RDS, given its name, is obviously focused on relational databases. It offers a managed service for MySQL, MS SQL Server, Oracle Database, Postgres, and MariaDB. Amazon Aurora is Amazon's own database platform and comes in two editions, one with MySQL compatibility and the other with Postgres compatibility. As a managed service, RDS is simple and fast to scale, gives you fast, predictable performance, and you only pay for what you consume. Some of the key features of RDS are the ability to provision a database in six minutes. Why is it six minutes and not five? Well, it's because I've tested it, and that's what I got the number when I uh, tested it. You can provision a multi-AZ database with a few mouse clicks. This configures a master database in one availability zone and a standby database in another availability zone. When we replicate the data synchronously between the master and standby, if there is a failure in the hardware, networking, storage, etc., then RDS will automatically fail over to a standby instance with about 60 to 90 seconds downtime. You can scale a database up or down using the same mechanism with 60 to 90 seconds downtime too. RDS will take the standby offline, resize it, and then bring it back online again. Once it is caught up, then RDS initiates a failure, failover from the primary to the standby. The old primary is then resized and configured as the standby. If a patch will take longer than the 60 to 90 second failover window, RDS will automatically include a failover as part of the patching process to minimize the downtime required. Adding a read replica to the database can be a multiple step process that is really error prone. With RDS, you can create a read replica with a few mouse clicks. And RDS supports up to 15 read replicas for MySQL, Postgres, and Aurora. RDS creates daily snapshots of your databases at a time you configure and keeps them for up to 30 to five days. When you create an RDS instance, you specify the time you want the backup to occur and how long you want the backups to be kept for. The default is seven days. You can also create user snapshots at any time that are kept until you explicitly delete them 
All of the backups are kept in S3 with 11 nines of durability. The database logs are sent to S3 every five minutes too. This enables RDS to recover a database to any point in time by restoring a snapshot to a new instance and applying the logs up until the failure or the user error occurred. The majority of AWS services allow you to get metrics down to one minute interval intervals. However, RDS was the first service to introduce detailed metrics that go down to one second intervals. You can also secure your data with a single click to enable encryption at rest. SSL is supported to encrypt data in transit too, with the option to make it mandatory on Postgres and SQL Server for SSL connections. Now I'd like to talk about Amazon Aurora that is built upon the RDS platform. So what is Amazon Aurora? It's a MySQL compatible and Postgres compatible relational database platform with the performance and availability of the commercial databases delivered as a managed service. AWS announced the MySQL compatible edition at reInvent in 2014 and the Postgres compatible edition at reInvent in 2016. If you're going to build a new database for the cloud, then you don't want to use the same architecture that has been around for the, since the 70s. AWS decided to build a new database platform using a service oriented architecture. The storage layer has been broken out into a separate database optimized storage service that receives the database changes in the form of log entries, not file system blocks. This is a huge difference and the main benefit of the Aurora platform. It is also integrated with other AWS services to help manage Amazon Aurora, such as EC2, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon Simple Workflow, and Amazon Route 53. Backups are continuously taken from the storage service and integrated with Amazon S3 with 11 nines of durability. You can also create a manual snapshot and save that in S3 too. This slide demonstrates the large differences between the storage operations of RDS in a multi-AZ environment and Amazon Aurora with the same failover capability. On the left-hand side, you can see the RDS MySQL environment and on the right, Amazon Aurora. MySQL has a primary instance and a standby instance in another availability zone. Think of that as a data center. The primary database has to write to an EBS volume, which is replicated by EBS in the same AZ. At the same time, the same write is sent across to the standby and the same write to the EBS is applied there. Bin log files and other metadata is also kept up to date across both instances. On Amazon Aurora, there is a primary instance and a read replica. There's no need for a standby instance that can't be accessed like in, my, uh, in RDS MySQL. This is because read replicas become failover targets in Aurora. The storage is located across six locations in three availability zones and kept consistent by the storage service. There is a quorum of four needed for an acknowledge write and three for a read, providing a highly resilient storage tier. Yet, as discussed before, the database just needs to send the log or change information to the storage service and replicate some basic information to the read replica. This greatly reduces the amount of I.O. that Aurora needs to do for a given transaction load increasing the scale that Aurora can handle when compared to RDS and traditional databases. We only have a short amount of time and there are so many features of Aurora, so I just want to go over a few key features. As mentioned, the storage is highly available with six copies across three AZs and backups are continuous to S3. With the read replicas operating on the same storage as the master instance, there is minimal lag, typically less than 20 milliseconds. This solves a big problem for MySQL users who often have read replicas that lag into minutes when there is more than 2,000 IOPS of activity on the primary database. The storage is auto-scaling. It simply adds 10 gigabyte segments as they are needed. The storage service also identifies hotspots and moves data around to maximize throughput and minimize contection. Recovery is single-threaded with MySQL whereas Aurora does parallel distributed and asynchronous recovery that greatly decreases the time that your database becomes available after a restart or a crash. This is possible because the storage engine can apply the log changes to each storage segment in parallel. Related to recovery time is survivable caches. When you restart a relational database, the cache is part of the database process, so the data is lost. 
However, in Aurora, the cache is a separate process that survives a database process restart. This means that when you restart the database, the data is already available in the cache, preventing the surge and disk activity that is normally needed to bring the data into memory before the application can perform at its peak performance again. Normal databases suffer from such brownouts as the data is read from the disks into memory. This all contributes to faster, more predictable failover. Speaking of faster, when Aurora is compared to MySQL on the same hardware at scale, it is up to five times faster. It should be noted that this is not a single query running, but a lot of connections running lots of queries. For Postgres, it's more than two times faster on the same hardware. If you would like to know more, AWS has published the benchmark information and how to replicate the MySQL benchmarks to the, on the AWS website. When you are using RDS at scale, it is common to have large instances with uh, such as R3 8x large with 32 vCPUs, 256 gigabytes of RAM, and provision IO storage. Customers then have the same instance and storage for the primary, standby, and at least one read replica. With Aurora only needing one set of storage and a read replica, for failover, it can be significantly cheaper than RDS MySQL at scale. When you take into account that Aurora is also faster than MySQL, it is common for customers to find that they can halve the instance size on Aurora 2, making further cost reductions. There have been a series of recent improvements with, Aurora, with the Aurora platform that you can read here. I'll call out a few of them. Fast DDL allows for adding a new column to MySQL table without having the typical table copy operation that happens with MySQL today. Zero downtime patching looks for a window of low activity, suspends the connections, performs the patch, and then restores the connections. This happens so fast that most users would not even notice. Having the small T2 instances and the medium instances available for Amazon Aurora allows you to run your dev test environments and small databases at a much lower cost. Amazon Aurora is now available in all three AZ regions, with recent regions including London, Montreal, Ohio, and San Francisco. Looking across the RDS engines, you can see some of the major features of the RDS platform and how they are supported by each engine in this slide. Aurora offers a lot more storage than all the other engines, with 64 terabytes available instead of six terabytes for the Linux-based databases and four terabytes for SQL Server. As a result of having less storage, SQL Server also has less IOPS available. SQL Server has no ability to resize the storage without a backup and restore process. This is done through a standard .back file exported to S3 and then imported with a new uh, instance with larger attached storage. These gaps across the RDS platform are all things we are looking to improve, so stay tuned for future announcements. On to Elastacache. This is our managed caching service for Memcache and Redis. Why is in-memory caching becoming more important today? Everything is becoming connected with the rise of IoT, from phones and tablets to cars, air conditioners, and even toasters. There is a demand from real-time real performance with online games, ad tech, e-commerce, and especially social apps. For example, if your parents are on holiday in another part of the world and they upload some photos to Facebook, you expect them to be instantly available for you to view and load as quickly as possible. This is a difficult problem to solve. Load from these types of applications can be spiky too. For example, a promotion for a game or an online sale at a web store will drive many people to an app or website. In many cases, the database becomes the bottleneck and overall application performance in these situations. To help alleviate reads from the database, the best thing to cache are small, frequently accessed items, such as products in a catalog, session information from a game, and top articles on a news site. This can greatly reduce the demand on a database and then increase the scale of the application without needing to increase the size of the database server. The two caching solutions offered by the Elasticache service are Memcache and Redis. So let's take a look at each engine. Memcache is an in-memory cache with a multi-threaded architecture that can consume multiple cores. It doesn't support any persistence model, so you have to design your application to deal with cache failures. 
Memcache only allows a storing of string values, so for some users this can be a deal breaker. It does scale well, well horizontally by adding a few nodes and sharding the data across each node. Redis is a more advanced in-memory cache, but it is single-threaded. It supports read replicas, and in version 3, Redis added support for clustering to scale out. The persistence model allows you to take snapshots and create new instances or clusters from these snapshots. Atomic operations allow you to use it for counters and other critical operations. There are also advanced data types, such as ordered sets that are great for game leaderboards, top article, article lists, etc. Some customers even use the PubSub messaging feature, like a queue. And we see most customers using Redis these days instead of Memcache. It's important to take advantage of the AWS and Intel partnership for any workload on AWS, and Alesta Cache is no exception. Intel works with AWS on each new AWS instance family to inherit the benefits of both the latest Intel CPU and the chipset platform together, with AWS improvements along the way too. The new AWS instances are often much cheaper than the old ones too. Therefore, it's important to upgrade to the latest instances to maximize your performance and lower your costs. For example, with Elasticash Redis, this means you can achieve 34% greater throughput using M4 instances versus M3 inst instances and at a lower cost. DynamoDB is a managed NoSQL database with low latency and highly durable storage. It's designed for tier one applications. It offers massive and seamless scalability with some customers writing in excess of a million writes per second to a single table. DynamoDB offers an amazing feature of providing consistent single digit millisecond latency at any scale, even when scaling size or throughput requirements. The storage is located in facilities in all regions, even those with two AZs to provide highly available and durable storage. It's easy to use with simple APIs to get and set information. It supports both key value and document models, and there are no table size or throughput limits. The blue line on this diagram represents the number of requests coming into DynamoDB with various peaks and troughs along the way. The green line represents the average latency of DynamoDB during the same period. This demonstrates that no matter what the number of requests coming into DynamoDB are, that the average latency stays consistent and predictable. This also applies when you are scaling up or down the provision throughput on DynamoDB or operating on the provision limits. Some of the popular use cases for DynamoDB are adtech, IoT, gaming and mobile web applications. A consistent use case across many different industries is user profile and login management. Often, companies will hold a large promotion or event that requires many users to log in all at the same time. For example, a gaming company could send out a notification telling users to play the game now and they could receive a gem, or a telco could launch the latest iPhone. Each of these situations will create a logon storm that relational databases would struggle to deal with. DynamoDB is able to scale up for the promotion and then back down again afterwards, so you only pay for the throughput that you need when you need it. Now we move on to Amazon Redshift, a relational data warehouse that is massively parallel and scales to petabytes of data. This managed database service offers both magnetic and solid state disk options depending on your performance and storage requirements. Costing 1,000 per terabyte per year, it is significantly cheaper than other data warehouses, and you can even start at 25 cents an hour. Some of Redshift's key capabilities are being completely scalable, going from 160 gigabytes to up to two petabytes of information. It's fast with parallel execution uh, on compressed, sorted data on optimized hardware. It's also inexpensive because you can start at that 25 cents an hour on, or $1,000 per, per terabyte per year. From a managed service perspective, it's easy to provision, backup, restore, patch, and scale. And on security, you can load and store encrypted data, you can have SSL for data in transit, and you can have audit logging too. It's also innovative with over 100 new features since launch. 
It has a large ecosystem with major data integration and visualization ISVs supporting Redshift with a large consulting partner base. I'd like to talk about a use case for weblog analytics from our parent company, Amazon.com. As most of you have used Amazon.com, you would know the website is heavily customized for each user based on previous purchases, browsing history, and other information. The amount of data required to manage this process is more than one petabyte, with two terabytes added every day, and the largest table at 400 terabytes. This workload is growing at 67% year on year. The legacy data warehouse could query across one week's worth of data in an hour. When using Hadoop, they were able to get that to one month's worth of data in the same amount of time. So that's quite a good improvement. Once the team migrated to Amazon Redshift, they were able to query 15 months worth of data, which is one petabyte in 14 minutes. They were also able to load 5 billion rows of data in 10 minutes. A large join of 21 billion rows with 10 billion rows used to take three days on Hive, but now came down to two hours with Redshift. Even the load pipeline that ran on Oracle technology came down from 90 hours to eight hours. To deliver on this performance, the team uses 64 clusters with a total of 800 nodes across all the clusters and 13 petabytes of provisioned storage. Yet because Redshift is a managed service, they only have two DBAs. This brings us to the end of the section on managed database services on AWS. In summary, I discussed the benefits of Amazon RDS for relational databases, including Amazon Aurora platform. I covered Amazon Elasticache that supports both Memcache and Redis to help speed up and scale your applications, Amazon DynamoDB, which is our NoSQL database with consistent latency and near infinite scalability that supports both key value and document models. Finally, Amazon Redshift is a petabyte scale parallel columnar data warehouse. There are some reasons you may not want to use the database services I just mentioned, but that doesn't mean you can't use AWS. If your database is on Windows or Linux, you can run it on EC2. There are many AMIs available from the technology partners such as Oracle Databases, MS SQL Server, MongoDB, Vertica, and from the marketplace for licensed products such as Teradata. There are also white papers on how to run Oracle Database, MS SQL Server, MongoDB, Cassandra, and others on AWS, including both RDS and EC2 where applicable. So why would you use EC2? Well, there might not be the AWS managed service for the database you want to use, such as Cassandra. You also might need more control than what RDS offers for the integration with other software or local file system access. Sometimes you might need to use the latest EC2 instance that is not available on the managed service yet. Or you might need more than six terabytes of storage that RDS offers at this stage. One of those new instance types is the X1 instance. It's designed for large scale in-memory applications in the cloud and is ideal for in-memory databases like SAP HANA and big data processing applications like Spark and Presto. The instance is powered by Intel Xeon E7 Haswell processors with up to 128 virtual CPUs and two terabytes of RAM. We just announced that we'll be increasing the amount of RAM in the X1 family with a new X1e32 large instance with four terabytes of RAM. And we are also working on instances with eight to 16 terabytes of RAM. Whether you want to migrate your applications to AWS and use EC2 or the managed services, you have to work out how to migrate the databases securely and ideally with minimal downtime. The AWS Database Migration Service, or DMS, allows you to perform homogeneous and heterogeneous migrations between the various databases on the slide here. The migrations can be carried out with Change Data Capture, or CDC. This allows the source database to remain active during the migration, keeping your application up and running until the target database has caught up. Let's take a look at how it works in more detail. On the left-hand side, you can see the existing applications database on-premise and the users connecting to that. On the right-hand side is AWS with an empty database ready for the migration. In the middle is the networking. We are using a VPN in this example, but it could be using our Direct Connect option too. To start the migration, we need a replication instance, which is 
running the database migration service. Then, once that is started, you need to provide the connection information for the source and target databases. Next, you need to choose what data you want to migrate to AWS. DMS allows you to choose specific tables, schemas, or the whole database. Then sit back and let DMS do the rest. It creates the tables, loads the data, and best of all, keeps them synchronized for as long as you need. That replication capability, which keeps the source and target databases in sync, allows customers to switch applications over to point to AWS at their leisure. This means that DMS eliminates the need for high stakes extended outages to migrate production data into the cloud. DMS provides a graceful switchover capability. DMS is also very cost effective with no upfront costs. With the AWS Database Migration Service, you pay for the migration instance that moves your data from your source database to your target database. Each database migration instance includes storage sufficient to support the needs of the replication engine, such as swap space, logs, and cache. Inbound data transfer is free. Uh, additional charges only apply if you decide to allocate additional storage for migration logs or when you replicate your data to a database in another region or on-premises. The database migration service currently supports the T2 and C4 instance classes. T2 instances are low cost standard instances designed to provide a baseline level of CPU performance with the ability to burst above the baseline. They are suitable for developing, configuring, and testing your database migration process and for periodic database migration tasks that can benefit from the CPU burst capability. C4 instances are designed to deliver the highest level of processor performance and achieve significant higher packet per second performance, lower jitter and lower network latency. You should use C4 instances if you are migrating large databases and are looking to minimize the migration time. While DMS migrates the data, we are finding more and more people are looking to switch database engines. So what happens if you're converting from one database engine to another? Where does that magic happen? This is where the AWS Schema Conversion Tool steps in. SCT supports the migration of Oracle Database, Microsoft SQL Server, MariaDB, Postgres, and MySQL to any of the open source engines. We don't support the migration to Oracle Database or Microsoft SQL Server because both Oracle and Microsoft provide their own tools for the job, and most customers want to migrate to open source databases anyway. SCT also supports the migration of Teradata, Oracle, Netezza, Greenplum, MS SQL Server, and Vertica data warehouses to Amazon Redshift. SCT also supports a schema copy function. I'm sure many of you have been in the situation where an old system doesn't have any documentation or even the DDL to create the database. That means the only definition of the database is the live production system. SCT can create an exact copy of such systems to help migrate them to AWS. The other useful feature it has is the ability to make RDS recommendations, including whether you can use cheaper versions of the database. For example, if you're using Oracle Database Enterprise Edition, but SCT finds that you're not using any Enterprise Edition features, then it will recommend that you can use Standard Edition 1 or Standard Edition 2 when migrating to RDS. On this slide, you can see what the SCT interface looks like. On the left side, you have the source database information, and on the right side, you have the database information for the target. In the middle, at the top, is a list of issues that Schema Conversion Tool has found, and below that are two windows, one for the source program unit and one for the target. This allows you to see what the problem is and make the appropriate change. The object that SCT migrates are listed on the far right. This includes all basic things like table, indexes, and view definitions, but also the complex packages and store procedures. Another trick that SCT has up its sleeve is the ability to process your application source code and fix the SQL statements in line. This feature can greatly accelerate application and database migrations, especially for poorly written applications with SQL code written throughout them. The final thing I want to talk about with respect to the schema conversion tool is its most important feature. It should also be the first thing you do when you consider a migration of a database. That is the assessment report feature. Once you connect the schema conversion tool to the source database and select what target database you want, 
SET can produce the assessment report that will list all the issues it found, the number of occurrences of them, and why it is a problem. This is an essential tool for understanding the complexity of a database migration and for assisting with project planning. If you are interested in learning more about what I've discussed today, you have several options available to you. To gain more confidence and hands-on experience with AWS, watch our instructional videos and explore the self-paced labs. Additionally, you can attend our instructor-led classes by qualified AWS instructors and learn how to design, deploy, and operate highly available, cost-effective, and secure operations on AWS. And finally, remember to validate your technical expertise with AWS certification. This brings me to the end of my session. I hope you found it useful. Do remember to complete the survey by visiting the link on the screen today. With that, I would like to thank you for attending AWS Innovate.